This is The Pi Gamer by Adafruit. I've had this for a couple of years now and got it when my youngest boy was being introduced to coding at school. Let's take a look at the specifications of the Pi Gamer. It's powered by the ATSMD51 microcontroller with 512 kilobytes of flash and 192 kilobytes of RAM. There is 8 megabytes of QSPI flash for images, fonts, sounds and game assets and a micro SD card slot for even more storage if the onboard QSPI flash isn't enough. I feel the display is a little lacking being just 1.8 inch with a resolution of only 160 by 128 which is marginally less than the original Game Boy, although it is colour. I do feel we need to take into consideration the price of the device though, which when purchased as just a PCB and not as a kit is under 45 US dollars. There's an analogue thumbstick along with four buttons. The five NeoPixel LEDs can be used for a range of purposes, for example scorekeeping. There's even a triple axis accelerometer, which you can use to control your games with motion. The bare bones PCB doesn't come with a speaker, that's an optional extra, but there is a 3.5mm headphone jack. As for power, the bare bones PCB doesn't come with a battery, but there is provision to connect an optional extra LiPo battery to the board. You don't need a battery to get started, you can power the Pi Gamer using a micro USB lead. Games are also transferred to the Pi Gamer over USB. The Featherwing connectors make it compatible with Adafruit's range of Featherwing boards. And finally, here is the reset button and power switch. My Pi Gamer is just a PCB and not a kit, so needed a case. Having recently been given a 3D printer by my good buddy Rory from the YouTube channel Rate My Funeral, I thought I'd give printing a case a go. Being new to 3D printing, I wanted to opt for the path of least resistance, a design that someone else had already done. If you haven't already discovered Thingiverse.com, you need to visit this website after you've watched this video. There are tons of user-generated designs available for download. Adafruit uploaded this case design, so I thought I'd give it a go. I downloaded this bottom part, this top part, the bezel, and the button files. I started the print in high quality and overall it took around 16 hours to print everything out. And this is how it turned out. I was a little disappointed with the remnants of a previous print being visible. If anyone has any tips on cleaning the print bed or preventing this from happening please let me know in the comments down below. However, I do find the texture created by the print bed somewhat pleasing. If we take a close look at the back of the print you can see that it isn't so neat and requires some trimming with a knife. Indeed, I couldn't get it to fit the board without trimming around some of the cutouts first. The bottom came out fairly well, but also required a little trimming. The bezel turned out okay, but the buttons were a complete disaster. They had stuck so much to the print bed that the plastic gave way when I attempted to remove them, and I ended up with this mess. But as it turns out, they are scaled wrong anyway and don't fit the Pi Gamers buttons. So now armed with my 3D prints, I attempted to assemble the unit and found that the snap fit wasn't that great, probably as I had printed without any supports, but also the design had no way of snapping the bezel into place. So what next? I could have tried another print, maybe adding some supports under the parts that snap the case together. But then my friends at PCBWay offered to produce and send me a 3D print from their professional printing service. I went with a resin print which uses a different technology to the FDM printer that I have. FDM printers heat up a plastic filament and extrude it from a print head, building up layer after layer. In contrast, the SLA printing process uses a photosensitive resin which is exposed to UV light to cure it. Like the FDM printers, the resin print is still built up one layer at a time. This time I used a different version of the case from Thingiverse. I found this one that has been modded to have a snap in place bezel. 
I did find an issue with the bezel though. The clips were too thin for the SLA printing process. So my good buddy Rory over at Rent My Funeral modded the 3D file for me. When the prints arrived, I was thoroughly impressed with the results. The feel of the resin just feels so much better quality than the prints that I had done. The resolution is also outstanding. At some point, I'll most likely spray these parts, but for now, I'm just going to snap them in place around my Pygamer PCB. The fit of the parts is so much better than that of my prints. This got me thinking about where and when I'd use a 3D printing service like this. For high volume everyday usage, I think that it would be too costly, but think about this. I've seen plenty of CRT monitors like this one and other retro hardware with damaged or missing plastic parts and covers. I've also seen great 3D replacement parts that people have designed, but it's the print quality that always lets them down. Using a high quality 3D print service is a great way of obtaining a high quality replacement part. Let's look at the kind of costs involved. So here on PCBWay.com, I'm going to select the CNC and 3D printing dropdown and then select 3D printing. Next, I'll drag and drop the STL file from Thingiverse and get an instant quote. These settings are the same as the case that I have received. So under 12 US dollars, now, take into consideration that for this cost, you have not had to invest in any equipment. So a one-off charge of around 12 US dollars to replace a missing flap on a CRT monitor with a high quality part is actually quite a good deal. Okay, now that my Pi Gamer is in its case, let's head on over to the Microsoft Arcade Make Code site. On this site, you can use either JavaScript, Python, or Blocks. If you've seen Scratch before, then you'll be familiar with the Blocks concept which is a great way to introduce people into the concept of structured coding. Here you'll find various tutorials, example games, and community games. Let's take a look at this one, Raptor Run. I'm sure you've all come across a variation of this at some point. Let's open it in the editor. And here you'll see the block code for the game on the right hand side and an emulated console on the left where you can actually test out the code without the need of downloading it into the Pi Gamer. So everything within this block of code called onStart will execute when the Pi Gamer starts the game. The dialog cursor is actually this little dude here and we can edit it by simply clicking the image. Let's give it some rather dodgy looking red horns. And then click done. Then in the emulated console, you can see that the image is updated. The text that is currently displayed is set here to Raptor Run and changing this updates the game accordingly. Clicking A will take us to the game. And the background color is what is defined here. So to change it, just click and select. Let's rerun the game and see what it looks like. Then the function initialize ground is called. So that's down here. And these sprites are what are used for the background that we can see in the emulated console. So let's edit one of those sprites like this. Now we can run the game and we can see the new background. Okay, I'm not going to go too deep into this today, so back to the on start block. The next function to be called is the initialize raptor function, which is down here. And this defines the animation for the raptor. Then the score is set to zero. And then end is set to zero. The end variable is used to keep track of the game state, i.e. has it ended yet. If it has, then it's set to 1. Finally, instructions are given to the user on how to play. Then we have these other blocks, on game update, that are executed as often as the update time. The forever blocks are executed during the game, well, forever. And this on any button press block controls the raptor jump. It is executed any time a button is pressed. So here we have this if statement checking if the raptor position is on the ground, which is y position 94 as defined in the initialize raptor function, and if the game hasn't ended. 
Then execute these two commands. The first determines how high the raptor jumps. It is a negative value as we want the raptor to leave the ground. So if we want the raptor to jump higher, all we need to do is change this value. Let's try minus 250. And if I run the game again, let's see how he jumps. Pretty high. The next command reactivates the walking animation for the raptor. Now to run this code on my Pygamer, I need to download it from the website. To do this, click the download button and choose the Pygamer. A small game file with the extension UF2 is downloaded and this needs to be copied to the Pygamer. Right, since this is an introduction video to the Pygamer, I'll leave you here. Why not use the arcade make code site as a way of introducing coding in a fun way to your kids. As always, thanks for watching. For more videos, subscribe and like.